Hello everyone, this is Dr. Shi Jun Wang um, from Baylor University. Um, today I am going to talk about the famous Beethoven Sonata Appassionata Opus 57 in F minor. Um, I played this piece for my undergrad audition um, and I only applied for two schools, Manhattan School of Music and uh, the Juilliard School of Music. Um, and before I start talking about this piece, which I assume will take many, many episodes because there's just a tremendous piece and, and it's very popular. A lot of people play this in competitions, in auditions, and also, you know, you, you, you hear this a lot in concerts, in live concerts. Um, but before I, I start digging into this piece, I want to share with you a true story that this is years ago when I was a undergraduate student um, during uh, the spring break. Um, and of course, for the college kids, spring break is great, right? You, you have a whole week off and the weather is getting warmer and you can travel and do fun stuff. But then for Julia professors, I think spring break is something they really do not look forward to um, because on that week, um, the school will invite more than 100 pianists to have live auditions on campus. Um, let's say each of them play 20 minutes. And some, I remember when I auditioned, I had, I had to play two rounds. Um, so that also adds up um, the hour. So on average, um, a, a audition week, a Juilliard, you will probably, if you were, were the, the judges, uh, you will have to listen to about 30 to 40 hours of, of music. It's, it's really uh, pretty hard um, for, for people who are really um, aged. Um, and I remember one day, it's maybe a Tuesday or a Wednesday, um, I was eating at the cafeteria um, and I saw Mr. Lowenthal and, and he just turned 91 and still actively teaching, but this was a long time ago, so he was like in his late 70s, uh, mid 70s, I would say. Um, and casually, I would just say, how's your day going, Mr. Lowenthal? Um, and, and he replied me, um, like this, he said, how do you think I am doing? Uh, I listened to seven times of Appassionata this one morning, seven times, right? So basically, most people on that day played uh, this piece, but also, you know, it also showed how popular this is and how much you can show your ability, right? Because this is, you know, a life-changing uh, 20 minutes for some people. And if they can play this well, that really it reflects it's a very good display of your pianistic ability, your technique, your music, and everything, your understanding of this uh, period. And of course, this is one of the uh, most famous and, and most heroic uh, pieces by, by Beethoven. Um, and of course, now is turning at November and uh, a lot of the times uh, we already receive are receiving applications for uh, college or graduate school auditions. That's also why I want to talk about this piece and I hope to help some of the uh, people who are preparing this for their auditions. And of course, I will leave a link uh, for for you to check out Baylor University. Um, we have uh, some numbers of, of uh, graduate teaching assistantship and we also have a very, very good undergrad uh, program for uh, piano majors. Um, uh, let's get back to this piece. Um, this one is in F minor. Um, a starts with pianissimo. And, and even for Beethoven, a soft start really is not something special, right? This has a soft start. And then, yeah, all this big works with a title. We have softer start. Um, however, to have this same melody two octaves apart with a broken chord is not something I would say is common. 
Right, interestingly enough, the other F minor piece, the very first piano sonata, also starts with a arpeggio instead of a chord like this. Or, or so uh, it, it's it's really it's not very uncommon, but the uh, opus two number one. You basically know from the first second that this is in F minor, but then this one, the first note is not an F, it's a C. Of course, we know it's the fifth of the tonic chord, but then for a moment, you're really unsure of the key. Yeah, I think that is the point. We do not know for sure what's going on from the very first note. It can very well go. Yeah, it can be A flat major, it can go right, it can be in C major because you, with one note you really do not know what key you will be in. Um, and the other quite interesting thing that we have to point out from the very beginning is that this time signature is 12 8. You have 12 eighth notes in one measure right that's quite complicated i you know it's not common to see this um 12 8 really it's uh almost like this is in four yeah you have four but then each beat has three notes in it so this is how you count one two three two two three three two three four two three yeah and Obviously, from um, measure 24, when you have when you have this perpetual motion, da 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 da, you have the same repeated note on every single one of the beats. Uh, every single one of the 12 beats, you have something. Um, from this moment, you start to have this perpetual motion. But even from the very beginning. We should already be thinking da 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 da. This way, we will have a consistent tempo. We're already thinking about that. Yeah. And also, if you do this, you would be really surprised to see how many people play this like that. Right? It doesn't sound very wrong, it sounds okay, but then it's, it's not correct. If you do this, it almost sounds like the A flat is an eighth note, one, two, three, one, instead of one, two, three, and one, right? So the space between A flat and F is really, really narrow. Yeah, it adds this atmosphere, it's very mysterious. is very very soft right pianissimo is as soft as Beethoven get he doesn't write pianissimos but then the intensity level is as high as it can get yeah you 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 uh, ideally the audience doesn't even dare to breathe when you're playing this opening okay and when we have this kind of doubling Right, this is not one octave apart, but two octaves apart. We also have, uh, we always need to make a decision of if we want to emphasize the bass or the top. Yeah, or there's a third option, you do them equally. Yeah, which you know also sometimes uh, happens. Um, I would think that the beginning is good. Yeah, if we emphasize the bass a little more, it sounds a little bit more mysterious. And then as you go up, you start to swift the center from the bass to the top. And here, this C is the most important note so far, because you're going basically from chaos to This is the melody uh, with a uh, complement downstairs. Uh, okay, and here 
I have two points to make and also those are the very fine details often missed by students. Um, the first one is on third measure, we do not have a hairpin. We don't have a crescendo. We don't have a diminuendo. We actually have that in measure nine with exact the same harmony and melody. The only difference is that the left hand is one octave uh, above. So measure nine, we have we have this, but then measure three, we only have we only have uh, there's no there is no dynamic marking. But it doesn't mean we don't play this chord with more intensity because this one is a diminished chord, right? It's the diminished seven of five, and the, the first one being the dominant of, of uh, F minor. So how do we do this? We have to do this through tone, not through timing or a dynamic. So a little deeper, and then resolution. Another point here, very, very important. Um, if we are counting in four, ideally we would like the four to be with a three eighth note or a dotted quarter per beat. One, two, three, four. It's very comfortable to, to count that way. But the ending of this phrase, also the first note of measure four, it's not a dotted quarter. It's only a quarter, yeah? So instead of counting one, two, three, four, one, two, which is what the ordinary people would do, it's the easiest thing to do, yeah? It's one, two, three, four, one, two, three. You have to release the keys a little bit ahead of the counting. One, two, three. And I think that sends a significant message, right? This unsettling feeling. It's not, it's nothing comfortable. It's not settled. It's not on the end. Or four measures later. But, right? You're, you're always very vigilant. You, you're alert. You, you, you know something big is coming, right? There's a huge storm coming but not now not at this moment but you can't get uh, off guard um, the other very very important uh, point that I have to make here is that we have to study all the trills very carefully um, unlike most of the other <laughs> earlier sonatas um, which note do you start the trio is clear mark, clearly marked by Beethoven. So in, in case of the third measure, we start from, uh, from C because he has a, a little grace note before the trio. Yeah, we go from C, D, E. Yeah, um, not all trios starts with the lower note yeah, in measure 12, uh, 11. Yeah, really, quite often, a student wouldn't pay such attention to this. They will play, yeah, which, which really it sounds OK. It doesn't sound terrible, but it's not what Beethoven wanted. Um, the other evidence is that if you have the same uh, edition, like I have the three edition, um, it has a, the fingering marking. Yeah, so for measure three, the marking is one, two, four. Yeah, so the trio you start on four, right? And then on measure 11, the trio, the finger marking is four, two instead of two, four. So if you just follow the fingering, that also tells you where uh, to start, which note you have, you have to start on, on, on this trail. Um, the second phrase, which start uh, pick up to measure five, starts on a very special chord, a Neapolitan six. And then four measures later, so you really want to make sure this is a special moment. Yeah, if you can't only do this by tone, it is totally okay to do it with 
a little tiny, a little delay. And then after this, doubling the D flat again, like the C, you have to make sure this is really properly voiced. It's not. Yeah, go with the flow. It's as equal as the other three notes. No, this is the top melody. Yeah, you have to really adjust. Yeah, again, one, two, three, not one, two, three. Yeah, it's not a comfortable ending, but then you have something unsaid. You have to uh, be interrupted. between major 9 and major 3 in this regard of the register uh, is that there is a hairpin there is a crescendo there is a miniendo how do we do that with one note yeah because you can't change the first note there's only one note to lead us to the crescendo which is the d and that's really a short ace note yeah um, how do we do that um, remember at the very beginning of this video I talked about how we should always think about this perpetual motion even from the very beginning so uh, instead of only doing the crescendo with D we actually have five beats on this note one two three two two yeah we have to count these note where well, we're holding the note with a crescendo so it's not like yeah it's not this one sudden subito or a, a accent but it's and we all know a piano doesn't matter how hard how much weight you push in it's not going to get louder but then as an audience, you understand I created a illusion of crescendo on this one chord. You should try it by counting one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, by counting it with a crescendo. And then the sixth note on the D is part of the first five notes, big crescendo so that it doesn't sound sudden, but then it's a result of the first five notes being a crescendo. Um, I spent 20 minutes, but only on the, not the first page, but the first two lines. Um, again, please bear with me. In the next maybe two months, I will be working on this in the finest detail. Uh, hopefully see you next week for the next episode.